So in beamforming, you use more than one sensor to collect the data. So you have a source somewhere. We'll assume that the source is far enough so that uh, by the time it comes to you, the rays come to you, they are sort of a plane waves coming at you. So the uh, signal, of course, uh, uh, gets to the sensor which is closest to it. So I'm going to call it ST. And then there will be a delay. And let's say we have two sensors separated by D. Uh, then you can clearly see, depending on the direction of arrival. So remember, direction is perpendicular to the wave front. Right? So you get the direction with respect to the array. Remember, array has a baseline. So you can denote this angle, or you can denote this angle, whichever. This is from the Bohr side. And uh, so you can see if this distance is d, uh, what is this distance? Anyone? That's the separation, right? The time it, the waveform here, I'm going to call it s of t. So the waveform here is s of t minus some delay. Question is, how much is the delay? Anybody? What is the delay? If this distance is d, what is this distance? If this angle is theta, this is 90 minus theta. If this is 90, this is theta. Then this distance is d sine theta, right? So tau is d sine theta over c, right? That's what the. Now, if I assume this is a narrow band source with some amplitude a. or some power p, then you see st minus t naught is going to be so this is going to be st e to the power minus j omega naught tau, right? But uh, omega naught tau is what? Omega naught is 2 pi over 2 pi F naught, F naught is C over lambda, and tau is D sine theta over C. So C cancels. So we can write this quantity as equal to, generally it's written like this. Uh, D over, uh, D is the separation. But what matters is to avoid aliasing, etc. cetera, uh, d over uh, lambda by 2. Usually the se separation is uh, uh, irrelevant with respect to lambda by 2. So we'll normalize uh, d over lambda by 2. Uh, so you see this, uh, the things are delayed. The two sensors are uh, separated by lambda by 2, or one unit, which is lambda by 2. Right? So then, then this will be 1. This is a dimensionless quantity. And in any case, uh, uh, so usually if the sensors are uh, lambda by two apart, then this will be one unit, two units, three units, etc. And I'm going to call, just to make things so simple, uh, this is going to be, uh, let's say, uh, I. Uh, and this I'm going to call it, uh, the whole thing I'm going to call it I uh, omega. So omega is uh, pi, in, pi sine theta. So of course, the signal now looks like st e to the power minus j omega, right? <coughs> Remember, omega is just a notation for uh, theta is the unknown angle. So if you have sensors at uh, 2D, uh, 2D from here, so another D, another D, etc. So if this sensor is at 2D, the last sensor it is at uh, MD. And if I call this signal to be X1, the second sensor to be X2, and the last sensor to be XM of T. So notice that the signal at the 2D will be uh, here, 2D divided by lambda by 2. So D over lambda by 2 is 1 unit. So that will be 2 units, etc. So if I define X of T 
to be x1 of t, x2 of t, etc., xm of t. For a single source, this will be first a signal will be s of t, then s of t e raised to minus j omega. Remember, omega is this pi, uh, and this is st e raised to minus j 2 omega, etc. And this we can write it in this, uh, this form. So this is going to be st1 e raised to minus j omega so usually this is called a direction vector So it's a spatial direction vector because the actual direction is theta. So you are collecting, what happens is from a source you are collecting n tuples of data. Generally, uh, this is a clean data, but generally the data also has noise, right? So you can add a, at each sensor there is a, uh, what, depending on where the sensor is, you can assume that there is also noise. So let me call this to be a n vector. So this is usually the form, right? So you have uh, duplicates of the signal, but the, if the signal is narrow band, it is phase delayed. And then you have all this noise uh, wherever it is. And this is just one source. So if you have uh, one source coming from direction k, theta k and another source coming from direction theta i, s i of t, uh, another source from here, another source from here, let's say theta 1 and theta, uh, theta i. Remember, all the directions are with the way I have drawn with respect to the normal, right? So you could say that this is a situation where I have, these are interferences. Uh, this is your desired signal, but everything is coming at you. So you collect the data from, uh, so this is the um, mode for one. So if you have multiple signals, uh, still you are collecting the data, so it will be like this, right? So they have k sources, uh, still n of t, right? So just to be clear, a k omega will be, or a, a omega k. Would be one e raised to minus j omega k, e raised to minus j two omega k. So that's generally the form of the data. Some are interferences, uh, some may be, one may be the desired signal. So generally the goal is you want to suppress all the interferences and uh, boost this signal, whatever. And sometimes these interferences may be actually multi-path. The signal also goes here and comes up, etc. That means uh, so the correlation between some of these SKs may be one, etc. So just to show the advantage of an array, let me take this uh, single uh, source case. This 
So why use an array? So in this case, x of t is of course st multiplied by a omega plus nt. So you can see here, you can already see, if I want to coherently add the signal, remember, look here. Each, each sensor, there is a signal component and noise component, right? There is signal plus noise at each, each sensor. Except that uh, you can assume uh, if the sensors are far enough, you, can, uh, you, can you may be able to assume that the noise is uncorrelated or partially correlated, etc. The best case is uncorrelated. So put it far away so that they are uncorrelated. You don't want to put the sensor on top of each other, right? So this is a vector, right? So let me, I'm just assuming one case. So you can clearly see, look here, the signal is phase delayed. So if I, if I, each sensor, I cleverly multiply by the conjugate of this delay, then I can add the signal in phase. Uh, whereas the noise will be, uh, um, so I'm going to create an output which is whatever is the conjugate of the thing I'm going to multiply that by that, right? X i t e raised to, uh, if there is minus, I'm going to put it by plus. See, if I do this, you can see here. Or this will be, or each of this is multiplied by its conjugate. So the signal here becomes m multiplied by st, whereas the noise, of course, is uh, <laughs> so this is the, uh, so if I look at the signal to noise ratio at the output, this is the signal part, so that's going to be m multiplied by st squared. Average value divided by, if I call this to be w of t, the output noise, that's going to be expected value of w t squared, right? Output signal to noise ratio. Uh, this, is, this whole thing is squared, right? This is squared, this is squared. So this is m squared p. I'm going to call this to be p. And the denominator is, look at here, w is this. So this is going to be uh, double summation, right? Double summation. Expected value is on nit, let's say n kt. Uh, then you have e to the power j i t i omega e to the power minus j k omega, right? This is star. Summation is on i k. But I'm going to assume uh, when i is not equal to k, they are uh, uncorrelated. So when i equal to k, they have equal value sigma squared. When i equal to k, this term goes away. Look at here. So this simply becomes sigma squared multiplied by m because sigma squared is the value of this when i equal to k. So m, m cancels, you get m multiplied by p over sigma squared, but that's the input to signal to noise ratio. So that's SNR input. So you can see the advantage of using, if you use m sensors, you can boost the signal to noise ratio by a factor of m, the number of sensors provided the noise is uncorrelated. So that's the simple thing, why even use an array? So generally what I have done here is called beam forming. Let me write this in a matrix form. So notice that uh, this expression, if I want, I can write this as, uh, so remember, this is A. So this I can write it as x1t e 
is to j So this should have been i minus 1, right? Because when i equal to 1, you want it to be 0. So this will be right. I use this term. I put it here. So this is the look at here. I already have a vector. A is a column vector with the minus. So what will be this one? Anybody? How will you express this in terms of A? Right. So that is A conjugate transpose omega multiplied by this vector. This is x of t, which we defined before. So you can define it uh, this way, output. So A is there. Oh, X is there also, so I'm going to remove this space. So this is the picture, if I put, uh, if this is x1, x cetera, of course, I, I hope you see the advantage, but this is, So you're taking, uh, previously in communication, you have one sensor, you are only taking advantage of time. You sit there and collect data in time. Here you are sitting and collecting data both in time and space. So space-time adaptive processing is what uh, you are, and then you want to adapt to the data. If there are interferences, you want to cancel it. If there's a signal, you want to boost it. So what we are trying to do is, uh, space-time adaptive processing. Adapt to what? So signal or uh, whatever, right? So the simplest processing is uh, that uh, whatever is the output, you put a set of weights, W1, uh, WI, uh, WM. Uh, so uh, the, your output is going to be sigma WK star XKT. So this, of course, I can write it as But this is my x of t. So the question is what weights to use. So if I define uh, a weight vector w to be w1, w2, etc., wm, so you can see this is the transpose of that. So you have w star x of t. Of course, in uh, what I have done here is a special weight vector. Look here. Here the weight vector is w is a. So this is called the beam former because you are. Uh, you are collapsing all the phase differences or the phase changes of the single signal is uh, all phase aligned to be coherent, the signal part, whereas the noise is, of course, added incoherently. Right? So if you, if you pick a W to be A, that's called the beam former. So this is, so the general expression is here and if you want to look at the output power, we can look at it. Uh, so P naught, which is expected value of WT squared, is expected value of uh, W star X of T 
squared. So that's going to be expected value of W star X of T and it's conjugate transpose. So that's going to be X star W star. So the expected value is only inside. And this is the covariance matrix because remember this is a vector. So you can write it like this. So the output power turns out to be W transpose RW. And the special case of uh, If I choose W to be a, a particular direction that you are interested is interested in, then that is beam forming along that direction. Because look at here. I will show you why it is called a beam former. So this is the output. Uh, I hope you see what is uh, R, why RW is like this. So R is what? RXX is expected value of X of T, X of T transpose. Remember X of T is what? X1 of T, X2 of T, etc. XM of T. That's this. Its transpose is x1 star, etc., xm star t, expected value. So this is going to be a matrix, will be r11, r12, etc., r1m, rij here. So rij is, you are actually correlating everything across space and time. This is xi of t xj of t star. See the averaging on the time is here. i and j represent space. So the, it's a correlation across space, both space and time. So this is, a co this is the space-time covariance matrix. This, expect this expected value is on time. But uh, expected value is on spatial, different spatial, uh, different array components. So you take advantage or you take the correlation in of both the aspects. In a single receiver, you don't have the advantage of space. Here you bring in both. So you should be able to do better than just operating with one sensor. That's the whole point. So this is the space-time covariance matrix. And then, of course, if, uh, if you know the structure of S, you put it into this. But let's proceed generally. So PB naught is, if you PB, remember, so this is, remember this expression. So the output power uh, using a particular sense, uh, weight vector is going to look like this. If you use a particular weight vector, the output is always W transpose RW. So the question is, what is the weight vector? The easiest one is, remember, I don't know what this is. Of course, the weight vector has to depend on if you want to suppress the signals coming from these directions and boost something in this direction, I need to know where the other things are coming from. And uh, if you have no knowledge, then you say, I, I know this is the direction I want to look. So then I can, I remember earlier we said, if you, if you use this weight vector, it is the same as aligning the face for things coming from that direction. If you do not know which direction thing is coming from, you just scan electronically. This is what is electronic beam scanning at the airports, etc. One direction, another direction, except you do it fast enough. So the weights will keep changing depending on which angle you are looking at. So you can scan the sky. So let's use uh, this, so PB naught is going to be what? This is going to be A star omega naught, RXX, A omega naught, right? 
So let me take a single source and see why this is called a beam former, you will see. So suppose X of T is ST So this is your x. So here the covariance matrix is, look at here. This is going to be, this is a scalar. So this is going to be expected value of st squared multiplied by a a transpose. Because how do you find the covariance matrix? Look here. It's expected value of xx transpose. That's going to be sa multiplied by a star a star. S a star I picked up here, a a star is here plus expected value of n and star. So that's the noise covariance matrix. I'm going to assume that the noise is all of this form. This is assuming that the noise is uh, uncorrelated from element to element, and it's equal variance at each sensor. If the variances are different, you put sigma 1 squared, sigma 2 squared, sigma n squared, etc. But I'm taking the simplest case. So if this is the case, if for a single source, I can write this as So this is for a single source. So let me put this expression here. So then you can see this becomes P multiplied by its compact conjugate squared plus sigma squared uh, a star A. A star A is M, right? What is A star A? Anybody? A star, any omega, A star A is what? Remember, A is where? A is, uh, A is just a phase vector, right? Right, right. So 1 E raised to minus J omega. So what is A star A? <coughs> M, right? So sometimes to normalize, <coughs> I could have done it. We also could have defined, sometimes A is defined as, so, so let's leave it like this. So A star A is uh, M, so you get this one. So let's look at uh, this pattern. This is what, a vector like this multiplied by a vector like this. Here an element is going to be e raised to minus j omega. Here an element is e raised to plus j omega naught, right, i. So I hope you see that when you multiply this with this, what do you get? Sigma e to the power minus j Do you see this or you don't? Uh, I, I wrote for a star omega naught, that's this. So this entry is 1, 1. Uh, so this multiplied by, this is plus sign, this is minus sign. Uh, the only difference is omega and omega naught. So this will be here. Uh, plus uh, a star, plus sigma squared m, right? So this is not going, this is just like a base. Now this you should be, there's a P here, right? This you should be able to sum this. What is the sum of this? This is a, a what is the sum of this? Anybody? So here, this is exactly the same form where R is, uh, if I define R to be E raised to a j minus j omega minus omega naught, right? So what's the sum of this? What did you say? This is only m minus 1, right? So this is r to the power m over 1 minus r. So let's not worry about this uh, sigma square number. Let's just change the base to, or we can add it later. So this is going to be p 1 minus e to the power minus j m uh, omega minus omega naught divided by 1 minus e raised to minus j 
omega minus omega naught. Absolute value squared, absolute value squared plus sigma squared i. So that comes out to be, let me pull out half of this outside. You, you know that trick, right? If you pull out half of this, so this reads now sine m omega minus omega naught divided by, by 2 sine omega minus omega naught by 2. Here you have e to the power j m minus 1 omega minus omega naught, right? But that e to the power doesn't matter because it's absolute value squared. So this expression is known as the beam former. Whatever you remember, this is a function of <coughs> omega. Omega is the either way. Omega naught is the true angle. Omega is the angle you are you want. Omega naught is where you want to focus on the way I wrote, and omega is the angle you are coming from. And remember, this expression is well known, right? This is a well known expression. Plus the noise term is here, just a base. Base gets lifted. So let's plot that quantity. Remember, omega naught is where I am trying to focus. I don't know where I should focus, but there is a source coming at me at uh, omega, at a direction omega, right? What is omega? Anybody? Omega, don't forget. Omega is pi sine. So this is where the source is. I don't know it, but I am going to. Fo I am trying to focus here. But my idea is I'll keep focusing everywhere. But look at this pattern. So you know this, uh, basically, this is a digital sink, right? So this only this matters. So let me read this. To, now onwards, I'm going to read this difference to be omega, because that's the variable. But you can see, this, this will, where will this peak? Anyone? If I keep doing this, where is this going to peak? At omega equal to omega naught. So if, you, if I keep forming the beam, I, the beam will have maximum so when I keep going through this, this is going to have the peak value here, right? So, so this is called the main beam, and these are called the side lobes. So you can see, if, even if I do this, so long as there is only one source in noise, a dominant source, then uh, if I keep uh, uh, looking at the different directions, when I, I know that this beam is going to peak when I hit the true direction. So this shape, all I need to, so let me assume it is coming, all I need to do is study this shape. So look here, I'm going to re, uh, reclaim this to be omega, this variable to be omega, or you can use a different variable, uh, but so long as we know what we are doing. So beam, uh, bottom line is in beam former, uh, the gain pattern, so that's the gain. This is the advantage d to an array. So it has got a spillover from side lobes and so on. So of course the problem is if there is a, so when you are looking here, if there is a source sitting here, this can leak through the side lobe. This interference is also going to come in here through this side lobe. If there is an interference, so we'll see how to suppress it, etc. But let's take the, so the main thing is this beam former is sine m omega by 2 over. So this is the characteristics of the beam former. So if I plot this, so what's the value at omega equal to 0? Look here. What's the value of omega equal to 0? Yeah, because uh, you can use whatever, right? So to, avoid, to scale it, I'm just going to put an M here, just a scaling factor. What's the maximum value now at omega equal to zero? Well, I only did it so that this value is one now. So the shape is, because of the square, 
it will be like this. So what does this mean? These are the, this is the side lobe. So if you use beam forming, you get a gain pattern which looks like this. That's the beam width, because that's the main beam width. Uh, this is the, and this quantity is the peak side lobe. So what, do you, what would be ideally you want the peak side lobe to be? Anybody? You want to suppress it, and you want the beam width to be what? Main beam width to be as narrow as possible. And this value is 1, so this is going to be lower. So what do you expect? If m increases, what do you expect the, for the peak side lobe and the main beam width to happen? Beam width will become? And the peak side lobe? Huh? What happens to the peak side lobe? What? Well, let's see what, uh, what happens. So, Oh, let's see what happens to the, so let's compute both the quantities and see what, remember this is, we haven't done any complicated processing uh, because for any complicated processing you need more information. Here we am saying, I'm going to look everywhere. It's like what we do with the eye. I look everywhere to see where there is somebody, right? Scanning, right? Yeah, so electronic scanning, all you have to do is change the uh, weight vectors that you can do, increment the weight vectors by something, right? So, of course, g at 0 is 1. So, where is, this is easy to compute, right? Where is this value? Anybody? So to compute the uh, main beam, width, this will be when the numerator goes to 0, right? Hmm? Yeah, so this m omega naught by 2 should be equal to pi. This is the beam width. Half beam width, right? So this means omega naught is uh, 2 pi, as you said, divided by m. So since omega naught is uh, pi sine theta naught is uh, 2 pi divided by m. So if you want in terms of theta naught, it's going to be sine inverse of 2 over m. But the whole point is uh, this goes to 0 as m goes to m increases, right? So. The, you know, the beam width goes to zero. So in, in omega, it is uh, 2 pi over m. Uh, that's a half side, half, if you include both the sides, it's a twice that, okay, right? So beam width decreases. As m goes, to m becomes large. Okay, so that's good. Let's compute the peak side lobe also. So I'll do a rough calculation. So if this two, is the this point is two pi over m, what is this point? Anybody? Yeah, you can eyeball it. That's uh, four pi over m, right? Because this is equal to that equation becomes, uh, instead of pi, it becomes 2 pi. So this becomes 4 pi over m. So what will be, this is not exactly this uh, correctly, but uh, roughly what is this point, anybody? Uh, yeah, this is 3 pi over m, right? Not exactly, because to, to, write, to find the peak, you have, you, which you can do, you take the derivative of this quantity, then you will get a nonlinear equation, tangent and so on. But uh, so a slight adjustment, but this is enough. So let's compute the uh, g at uh, 3 pi over m. So that's going to be sine m 3 pi over m. Is it 3 pi over m or 3 pi? Yeah, 3 pi over m. But there is also a 2, right? So 3 pi over... Huh? 3 pi by 2 m. No, no, why? 
Bitcoin. This is 2 pi over m, 4 pi over m, half of that, right? And here it's going to be sine 3 pi over m, but uh, by 2, so it's uh, this. So look here, m cancels. What is sine 3 pi over 2? Anybody? What? Uh, m, which you added for yeah, yeah, here, right. So m cancels sine 3 pi by 2 is minus 1, right? Sine 3 pi by 2. So square of that is 1. So this turns out to be 1 over sine 3 pi over 2m. And there is an m squared. So I'm going to expand that quantity. So this, if you expand, you'll get 1m. Sine expansion is what? 3 pi by 2, 2m minus, what is it, 1, 3 factorial, 3 pi cubed over 2 uh, m cubed, etc. right? Squared. So look here, this m cancels with this. So you get this quantity to be 1 over 3 pi by 2 minus one third 3 pi cubed over 2 cubed m squared. Then the next term will be 1 over m4, right? Some constant, but the whole square. So you can see as m, a, m becomes large, these terms become negligible. And this whole thing goes to, oh, what is it, 2 over 3 pi squared. That's a constant. So this is uh, so this is a famous result. That's a minus 13.2 dB. So if you use simple beamforming, whatever you do, you can't reduce the peak side lobe beyond a certain level. By increasing more number of sensors, the peak lobe is not going to, you'll get a narrower beam width but the peak side lobe will be at the best uh, 13 point, uh, so there's a saturation, right? So then the only thing you could do is you have to bring in additional weights, but then you bring, then this becomes a window design business. So you bring in any, any other weights instead of, remember, it's called beam forming because you are a phased, a phased array, you are only changing the phases. So if you put any other weights, of course, as you know, the main beam width will decrease, uh, increase, but you can have a better side lobes. This is where the Chebyshev weights, Taylor weights, etc., comes in. And so you can uh, look into that. So you can go in that direction, but we'll take a different direction in the next class.